Once again, apostate Protestantism. Some of you may have heard of the Protestant Reformation, and the man by the name of Martin Luther may be familiar to your historical pocket, or you may have heard his name mentioned before. During the Dark Ages, when Rome dominated the religious uh, landscape, Martin Luther, a German theologian, in his pilgrimage to Rome, sat before a Bible, and he discovered in the Word of God that we are not saved by our works, but we are saved by grace through faith. And in the book of Habakkuk, he read these words, the just shall live by faith. It so influenced his life and sparked in him a yearning to move away from the dogmas of Rome, from uh, senseless works and senseless doctrines and things that had no foundation in Scripture that he decided to have the Bible translated from Latin in, into German. And it sparked what the world has now known as the Protestant Reformation. Now, what does Protestant mean? Protestant is a term that means those who are protesting against the teachings and the dogmas of the Church of Rome. And the Church of Rome has influenced millions of, millions of Christians through beliefs and teachings and practices that are traditionally based and not scripturally based. The Protestant Reformation began with a move back to a plain, thus saith the Lord. In other words, if God's word says it, that's what I'm going to practice. But something has happened over the course of the 500 plus year of the Protestant Reformation movement. And Protestantism, that was once a movement that opposed everything that Rome stood for, is now a movement that has embraced much of what Rome has advanced. Meaning they've abandoned to a large degree the word of God and have gone backward to the traditions and the teachings and the dogmas of Rome. And so we're praying today, friends, that you can see in God's word what needs to be done. And we pray that as we unfold this message today, that you will hear in God's word something that will spark your heart and lead you back to allegiance to Christ. All right. So all classical Protestants right now are just like, oh my goodness. So we're going to camp out here for a bit and lay the foundation as to what Protestantism actually is, as that will obviously be important before moving forward. First, he mentioned Martin Luther's pilgrimage to Rome. This was a very weak positioning of what was actually going on with Luther. Mr. Loma King, Luther still considered himself a Roman Catholic. They were not protesting everything about the Roman Catholic Church. Luther was a Catholic priest and professor. The idea that he just found a Bible one day and realized some novel doctrine that no one else before him believed and then decided to share it with the world is a caricature of history. For anyone who reads Luther, you're going to read a lot of the church fathers, namely Augustine and Ambrose. I hear a lot of SDAs that position the Reformation this way to try and justify their novel teachings that were born in the 19th century. They'll claim Luther did the same thing which evidences that, no, you're crossing wires and conflating what Ellen White claimed about him in the Great Controversy with actual church history. But more importantly, he claimed Protestantism simply refers to anyone that's protesting the teachings and dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. While this is a common belief, not just for SDAs, it's not entirely accurate. It tells you nothing about what Protestants believe. You're not Protestant by virtue of not being Roman Catholic. This is the much too watered down, too loose, and it proves too much. What do I mean by this? Such a lax definition would make the Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, the Coptic Church, etc., all Protestant when they're not. It would make all the other 19th century American cults Protestant when they're not. I know Rome loves to, to do that, to say, see, look how splintered and divided they are, and they want to lump in as many as possible, but no. This entire narrative tonight, and not just tonight, but the whole great contra, all that, it is entirely predicated upon this weak, vague definition. Mr. Loma King is also misinformed when he claims that Protestantism was once a movement that stood against everything that Rome stood for, like I just said. Again, showcasing either his lack of familiarity with those he's criticizing, 
or just knowingly dishonest because it's not at all true. But this is the SDA retelling and revising of history that's ultimately necessary for them to then write themselves into the narrative as modern day heirs of the Reformation and everyone else is apostate and mingled with Rome, etc. So what is Protestantism? Let's start by looking at a number of hallmarks of Protestant belief. We're not going to look at all of them, but we're going to look at a good number here. Because yes, certain beliefs are what define Protestantism. He mentioned Luther. Mr. Lomakang, part of me wonders if you've read much of Luther. Notice what Luther says the central hinge of the Protestant Reformation was in the bondage of the will. For those that do not know, I highly recommend if you're a Protestant and you haven't read Bondage of the Will, you need to order it now. Get on Amazon, wherever, buy it, read it. Bondage of the Will is Luther's written correspondence with Erasmus. Erasmus represented the Roman Catholic side of the Reformation at the very beginning. Well, not the very beginning, but toward the, the beginning. They debated the nature of the will of man. Notice what Luther says. Quote, It is not irreligious then, nor curious, nor superfluous, but it is most of all useful and necessary to a Christian to know whether the will does anything or nothing in the matter of salvation. Indeed, to tell the truth, this is the very hinge of our disputation. The very question at issue turns upon it. Close quote. The hinge of the entire Reformation swung on what is known as monergism versus synergism. Luther was defending monergism. The idea that God alone, mono, is free to save according to his own good pleasure and for his own eternal glory. Erasmus was defending synergism, which teaches that salvation is a cooperative effort between God and the creature, not God alone. That in order to save, God must first have cooperation from the free will agent in order to save them. Monergists believe that until God freely extends grace to the sinner, freeing their will from slavery to sin, they will have no desire to turn to him, which is why God then must first act freely and extend ineffectual grace. Now, Luther and some of the other reformers argued around some of the mechanics around, around grace, but they believed in an effectual grace that when God acts, that grace sets out to, to and actually accomplishes what it was set out to do. It doesn't merely make something a possibility. So God actually saves someone. Adventism is synergistic to the core, which is why when they try to claim to be heirs of the Reformation, it's almost hard to take them seriously. They're not monergists. And in my experience, I've heard many of them loathe and disdain monergism. Yet, as Luther points out, the hinge of the Reformation swung on this central difference. Mr. Lomakang, you didn't even mention this in your entire talk. You mentioned nothing about any of this. You'd think the Seventh-day Sabbath was the central hinge. <laughs> the way you talk. Adventism is on the Roman Catholic side of this issue. Adventists, you are on the Roman Catholic Erasmian side of this discussion. Of the Reformation. The central hinge. Your guys' biggest enemy, the beast. And you guys are like synergism on steroids. <laughs> Nevertheless, all of the churches across the board, not just Lutherans, are monergists. Understand that. That's hallmark number one. Now I want to look at a quote that we've looked at a number of times on the platform from Louis Burkhoff. It's from his Systematic Theology, which is back on the shelf behind me. Notice what he says. Quote, The churches of the Reformation from the very beginning distinguished between the law and the gospel as the two parts of the word of God as a means of grace. This distinction was not understood to be identical with that between the Old and the New Testament, but was regarded as a distinction that applies to both Testaments. There is law and gospel in the Old Testament, and there is law and gospel in the New. The law comprises everything in scripture, which is a revelation of God's will in the form of command or prohibition. While the gospel embraces everything, whether it be in the Old Testament or in the New, that pertains to the work of reconciliation and that proclaims the seeking and redeeming love of God in Christ Jesus. Close quote. 
So notice again, all of the churches of the Reformation across the board, Lutherans, Moravians, the Reformed, the Dutch Reformed, Anglican, they all affirm the law-gospel distinction and that both law and gospel from the Word of God serves as a means of grace. We're going to get into what exactly this means in a moment, but this is also central. This distinction is an interpretation principle. It isn't talking about just the Ten Commandments or, or Moses at Sinai, which is oftentimes what people think when they hear the term law. The law gospel distinction applies there, but it's something bigger that deals with how to interpret and apply the Bible. All Protestants, all Protestants. Yes, they have mechanical differences at, at some levels because you can get really granular and liter, really, you know, into the minutia. But all Protestants affirm that within scripture, there are statements of law and statements of gospel. They are not the same and do not function the same way when preached. A statement of law is anything in scripture that pertains to commands or prohibitions. Statements of gospel are anything that pertains to reconciliation, forgiveness, the love of God, etc. Both are necessary because both are in scripture, but they function differently. So notice what English reformer, William Perkins, lesser known English reformer, Notice what he says in his book, The Art of Prophesying, which by prophesying, he is talking about preaching. He says, quote, the basic principle in application, talking about of the Bible, is to know whether the passage is a statement of the law or of the gospel. For when the word is preached, the law and the gospel operate differently. The law exposes the disease of sin and as a side effect, stimulates and stirs it up, but it provides no remedy for it. However, the gospel not only teaches us what is to be done, it also has the power of the Holy Spirit enjoined to it. A statement of the law indicates the need for a perfect inherent righteousness of eternal life given through the works of the law, of the sins which are contrary to the law, and of the curse that is due them. By contrast, a statement of the gospel speaks of Christ and his benefits and of faith being fruitful in good works, close quote. So statements of law expose the need of a savior and a person's inadequacy. They stir up sin, just like Paul says in Romans 3.20. By the law, no flesh will be justified. The law brings a greater uh, knowledge of sin. It highlights sin, but it provides no remedy for the problem of falling short. Because God doesn't let anything slide. So in order to be just, which he is, Sin has to then be punished. So there's no provisions for if you break it. Statements of gospel, on the other hand, provide the remedy and solution, which is Christ. And that by virtue of being united to Christ, a person receives all of the benefits of such. So here is a visual side by side. The law. The law tells us what to do. The gospel tells us what Christ has done. These are not all the, the, the comparisons here. It's just an example. The law reveals our sin, but the gospel reveals our Savior. The law accuses sinners, while the gospel forgives sinners. The law kills and brings death, but the gospel quickens and brings life. The law is, it, it demands perfect righteousness, while the gospel gives perfect righteousness. The law is kept by doing, the gospel is kept by believing through faith. And then the law is revealed in both nature and scripture, and the gospel is revealed exclusively in scripture. Once one grasps this, it revolutionizes things, especially former Adventists. Once you realize that within scripture, that there are two threads running throughout the entirety of scripture, law and gospel, and you can recognize when a statement is one or the other, it is a game changer in understanding the plan of salvation in redemptive history. So suffice it to say, all Protestants, all Protestants, Adventists, don't you can't use the Calvinist boogeyman or any of that sort of stuff. All Protestants affirm the law gospel distinction. It is a hallmark of Protestantism. And this is in contrast to the Roman branch of the church muddying this distinction over time. The Adventist church does not uphold this distinction. <laughs> they teach that the law is the gospel. 
as we have looked at before, but here are just a couple examples to prove my point. And we could spend the whole night on this. The infamous Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 294, quote. She writes, Man who has defaced the image of God in his soul by a corrupt life cannot by mere human effort effect a radical change in himself. He must accept the provisions of the gospel. Oh, what are those? He must be reconciled to God through obedience to his law and faith in Jesus Christ. His life from thenceforth must be governed by a new principle. Through repentance, faith, and good works, he may perfect a righteous character and claim, through the merits of Christ, of course, the privileges of the sons of God. Close quote. So the provisions of the Adventist gospel are that through Jesus, you can be reconciled to God by your faith in him and your obedience to the law. With Jesus' help, your faith in him and your good works, you can perfect, meaning develop, a perfect character like his, and by doing so, attain the privilege of being a child of God. Adventists have tried every excuse in the book to justify the statement, does not change the fact, it doesn't jive with the law gospel distinction at all. Not possible. And that's the point. I don't care about all their ways of trying to justify the statement. The point is, it isn't Protestant. It is anti-law gospel distinction. Full stop. Again, Signs of the Times, July 31st, 1901, paragraph 7. Quote, For the highest good of his creatures, God has given a perfect law, a law that demands perfect obedience. God compels no one to obey this law. He leaves men free to decide whether they will obey and receive the reward of obedience or disobey and receive the punishment of transgression. Close quote. Not at all compatible with the law gospel distinction. Salvation is not a reward, friend. It's a gift. A reward is what one receives as recognition for an achievement or an effort. For example, notice Ephesians 2. Ever since their whole justification by faith push, they love to try and appeal here now to see, we're just, we love Ephesians 2. And yeah, okay. And you were dead in, your tr in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature a child of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which, uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, union with Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasur immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And thus the reading of God's holy word. So notice the flow. You were once dead in your sins and trespasses, something Adventism has to glaze over or outright ignore because they don't believe anything about a person can be dead if they are physically breathing. Yet Paul explains that prior to union with Christ, a person is dead in their sins and trespasses by nature a child of, uh, of wrath, like the rest of mankind. By nature, not behavior, Adventist friend, by nature. The behavior is a symptom of the nature. But then God has a response to this, and that response flows from God's mercy and love. Notice God is the first cause here. God is the first cause here, that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he loved us. It's like John tells us. He loved us first, not us loving him first. God is the starting point. In his great mercy, he raises the dead sinner to newness of life by uniting them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're even told why God, is the as the first actor, does this, like I said, to demonstrate the riches of his grace and kindness. The act of God in sending the Lord Jesus Christ who saves sinners demonstrates the loving kindness and grace of God. He doesn't need vindicated from the accusations of one of his creatures that ultimately comes about uh, by fallen man demonstrating they can keep the law perfectly with God's help to then silence the devil. That's all coming from the great controversy, not the Bible. 
Grace is unmerited, my friend. Otherwise, it's not grace. And salvation is a gift, not a reward. A gift is not a reward. And God is the one that bestows this gift upon the transgressor who is completely undeserving. And notice verse 10, the outflowing of God's doing is that the person united to Jesus Christ then walks out in good works as a result of what God already performed within them by raising them up, uniting them to Christ. And the result of such a thing leads to newness of life in Christ. Nothing about salvation being a reward. So Adventists can twist and squirm all they want to try and justify this Ellen White quote, but it doesn't change the facts. Salvation is not a reward that one receives based on their obedience to the law. She was right in so much as that the law does demand perfect obedience, but that doesn't mean that you get a bunch of do-overs because of what Jesus did, which is what SDA theology teaches. Perfect obedience means you've never violated it a single time. Not that you get a second probation to confess your sins to Jesus in a heavenly sanctuary, get cleansed repeatedly, and keep trying to eventually get to a point where you're now able to obey the law perfectly, demonstrating to God that you're safe to save, or demonstrating to all of the watching intelligences in the controversy. <laughs> SDAs love touting that they're all about obedience, yet I have yet to meet the SDA that's actually arrived at perfect obedience. <laughs> it's always, well, I'm trying my best. That's not perfect obedience. That's not the standard. So she's right. Perfect obedience is what the law requires, but your only hope is the perfect imputed righteousness of Christ, which is given, not in little spurts over time, like a substance to be infused, but in full. So you need to get on your hands and knees and beg God to have mercy on you and forgive you for ever thinking you could add anything to what the Lord Jesus has already done. As if anything that you do could ever supplement the perfect work of Jesus. And you need to confess to trusting in, in, in Jesus' legal standing before the Father alone and nothing that you do, thanking God for his mercy and not allowing the sun to set on you while you're in your deception, which would have sent you to hell. And then get off your knees and send your resignation letter to the SDA church, letting them know that you found the truth of the gospel, the true Christ, and that you want them as well to find the same thing and encourage them to join you and lead them to the same glorious news. Because until Jesus returns, and a person is given resurrection and glorification, they are going to war with sin. This is why the, S the SDA church is teaching around the nature of man is so problematic. But in their great controversy system, Satan supposedly accused God in heaven of his law not being fair. So part of, their sal of salvation in their system is siding with God in the great controversy and vindicating his character by demonstrating that with his help, of course, they're not full on Pelagians. <laughs> you can keep the law perfectly. This is what will then silence the accusations of Satan and vindicate God. So this is central to their great controversy worldview. SDAs, again, they'll make every excuse in the book to say, this quote is misunderstood, it's out of context, whatever. The point is, it isn't compatible with the law gospel distinction. And if you're going to claim to be heirs of the Protestant Reformation or Protestant or the, the last remaining bastion of true Protestantism that hasn't gone apostate like Mr. Lomenkang is going to get at, this is one of the telltale signs that you have zero business making such charge. The centrality of the law gospel distinction to Protestantism cannot be emphasized enough. If you are out of harmony with this, you have zero business claiming to be Protestant. So that is point two, monergism, law gospel distinction. The Roman church dismisses the law gospel distinction too. <laughs> this is point two that they're in line with Rome. The Roman church is synergistic. The Roman church rejects the law gospel distinction. So on these two issues, the SDA church is on the Roman side. Adventists, you're on the Roman side of those two issues, which are central hinges because the law gospel distinction is literally downstream from, I mean, it's basically at the same pond for Luther. Now notice, this is what R. Scott Clark says. I know there's mixed opinions of Dr. Clark out there, but notice what he says. Louis Burkhoff mentioned the law and the gospel being means of grace earlier. He's going to help us see exactly what this means. Quote, The two great branches of the Protestant Reformation, the Lutheran and the Reformed, agree that there are only two divinely instituted sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. They agreed that both are gospel sacraments, visible representations of the good news that was being preached in Protestant pulpits. What are the sacraments? Mere, mere symbols 
No. Visible represent, we're going to get into this more. Visible representations of the good news that was being preached in Protestant pulpits. They agreed that in the gospel, God declares sinners to be righteous by his free favor alone. And then he brackets in their sola gratia. You saw Peter Van Bemmelen mention that earlier. They claim to affirm sola gratia. No, you don't. Sola gratia has to do with God's free favor alone, a.k.a. monergism. It's not just, oh, grace alone, and then you just get to insert whatever you want in there. No, it's in response to something. Free favor alone, and that salvation is received through faith alone. Again, another phrase they latch onto and just insert their own understanding into, not understanding. That's a claim about, about sanctification and justification being distinct. They agreed that the sacraments are a means of grace, media gratia, by which God strengthens and encourages believers. They agreed that baptism is Christ's sign and seal of the washing away of sins by grace alone, that it is to be administered to believers and to their children, though they disagreed about its efficacy, and that the supper is his institution for nourishing the faith of professing believers. They also agreed that the Roman Church's doctrine, or yeah, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the memorial propitiatory sacrifice of Christ, so the Mass, in the supper is an idolatrous assault on the finished work of Christ. So Dr. Clark points out a number of other key Protestant distinctives here. Protestants believe in what is called the ministry of both word and sacrament. The ministry of word and sacrament. God's word is preached, which is absolutely necessary because the sacraments have no power outside of, of that. Like bread and wine here at my house are not sacraments. So God's word is preached, which the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist partner alongside as a unified ministry. As he points out, Protestants teach that the sacraments are visible representations of the gospel. So the word of God is preached, which entails both law and gospel. When the pastor preaches a statement of law, it points a person to Jesus, where the gospel is found. The law points people to Christ, where they then hear the good news of the gospel, are reminded that Christ is enough, we're accepted in him, all of the benefits of, of, of being in, in him, um, justified, forgiven, accepted, adopted, etc. It, union with Christ is really a term of identity. There is then a corporate call to confession of sin, followed by corporate confession of pardon, which both come from scripture. So at my local church, for example, we typically recite the Psalter and his cries of needing cleansed, forgiveness, etc. This is then followed up with a statement of gospel in the, the scriptures about forgiveness, acceptance in Christ, etc. We then believe that by faith and approach Jesus Christ at his table to partake of him in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. That sacrament is a visible sign to the senses of what we are promised in the gospel. Dr. Clark then explains that Protestants believe that God declares sinners to be righteous by his free favor alone. That's monergism. Which is what I said, what, what I said about sola gratia is truly about. Then he mentioned that Protestants believe in the sacraments being a means of grace. That they are used to actually strengthen, grow, and mature the believer, which is why both word and sacrament are necessary. This is again speaking to the ministry of both word and sacrament. And by the way, even again, there, there's differences around mechanics of things. But in the general and on the same foundation, when Protestants say grace alone, it is in that context of monergism. It's not just the general idea that God's grace is necessary. The Roman church believes that. They're not Pelagians. So there's a distinction there in how that word is being used that also doesn't align with Adventism. But nevertheless, Adventism does not teach that the sacraments are a means of grace. In their movement, it is strictly a memorial service. Christ isn't truly present. You don't actually partake of him. It's not paired with the preaching of the true gospel week in and week out as a dual ministry. They take communion like every 13th week or something like that. He mentioned how Protestants agree that, uh, the, that baptism is a sign and seal of the washing away of sins that's to then be applied to both believers 
and their children. Yes, all of the churches of the Reformation affirmed infant baptism, which the SDA church obviously rejects as being Babylonian or tradition with no biblical support. But finally, Dr. Clark then mentions how the reformers affirmed the finished work of Christ. They actually took umbrage with the Roman, the Roman mass for specifically that reason. Rome teaches that the mass is a representation of the same sacrifice of Christ that was on Calvary, and it is a propitiatory presentation of that sacrifice, an unbloody representation of that same sacrifice. The SDA church is in the same boat in that sense, in thinking that the atonement is a long, drawn-out thing with a second phase in heaven, as we've looked at a number of times in great detail before. They don't believe in the finished, finished atoning work of Christ at Calvary, something Protestants most assuredly do and reject any sort of notion that the atonement is still going on, let alone had a second phase that started in 1844, which flies in the face of so many other Protestant understandings, like the ministry of both word and sacrament. For the same reason, this is incompatible with Rome's system, it's incompatible with the SDA system. The work being finished is a part of what's signed to a person in the taking of Christ's body and blood every week. So, so far, we see that Protestantism is hallmarked by monergism, the law gospel distinction, the ministry of word and sacrament, infant baptism, and the finished atoning work of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at more Burkhoff. Notice what he says, again, from his systematic theology. Quote, he, talking about Luther, regarded the church as the spiritual communion of those who believe in Christ and restored the scriptural idea of the priesthood of all believers. He maintained the unity of the church, but distinguished two aspects of it, the one visible and the other invisible. He was careful to point out that these are there are not two churches, but simply two aspects of the same church. The invisible church becomes visible not by the rule of bishops and cardinals, nor in the headship of the pope, but by the pure administration of the word and, and of the sacraments. The Anabaptists were not satisfied with his position and insisted on a church of believers only. They, in many instances, even scorned the visible church and the means of grace. Moreover, they demanded the complete separation of church and state. Close quote. So another key foundation of Protestantism is the belief in a distinction between the visible and invisible church. This gets into their ecclesiological understanding of how the church is defined over and against what Rome was claiming. The visible church refers to the visible people you can see in your local church. The invisible deals with the heart, what you can't see. Unfortunately, there are unsaved people in local churches who are not actually born again. These people are only visibly a part of the church, but are not actually attached to Jesus, the root, by faith. But notice what Burkhoff says, a valid local church is defined by according to Protestant thought. Pure administration of the word and sacrament. You'll see this phrase again in a moment. The preaching of the true Christ and the true gospel rightly then administered through the use of the sacraments. Then he mentions the Anabaptists who were opposed to the Reformation and were a part of what is known as the Radical Reformation in opposition to the Protestant reformers with parties that claimed that the reformers had not gone far enough. They also advocated for a total separation of church and state. Who does that sound like? If Adventism is going to try and lay claim to history, this is who they need to point to, not the Protestant reformers. That's exactly what the SDA church believes. Anabaptists abhorred, I mean, it's, it's literally the name. They abhorred infant baptism, just like the SDA church. The Anabaptists dismissed the visible-invisible church distinction just like the Adventist church does. Adventists are hyper-averse to any sort of church involvement regarding government and politics. All of this stuff is in line with Anabaptists and the likes of the radical reformers, not Protestantism. Which is starting to paint the picture for us that Protestantism has m m most certainly been hijacked, just not in the way Mr. Lomakang thinks. Burkhoff continues. Calvin and Reformed theologians were at one with Luther in the confession that the church is essentially a communio sanctorum, a communion of saints. However, 
They did not, like the Lutherans, seek the unity and the holiness of the church primarily in the objective ordinances of the church, such as the offices, the word, and the sacraments, but most of all in the subjective communion of believers. They too distinguished between a visible and an invisible aspect of the church, though in a slightly different way. Moreover, they found the true marks of the church, not only in the true administration of the word and of the sacraments, but also in the faithful administration of church discipline. Close quote. So the Reformed and Lutherans, both branches of the Reformation, Anglicans too, have mechanical differences, but are foundationally united. Despite that, notice what Burkhoff says Protestants believe to be the true marks of the local church. Ministry of word and sacrament, which would mean proclaiming the pure gospel, not some present truth, special end times gospel that morphs based on time. Lutherans and the Reformed don't have different gospels, but the ministry of word and sacrament, as well as church discipline, being administered. You can maybe give the SDA church half a point on church discipline. But they are not engaging in, in, in the ministry of word and sacrament because the true gospel is not being proclaimed in their movement. And either is the true Christ being presented. You can't even partake of him in their movement through word or sacrament. And the sacraments aren't lawfully administered in accompaniment of that such that they are a means of grace in the people's lives. Adventists don't think of them that way. They don't think of like, oh, I get to partake of the Lord this week. Ah, I'm reminded of the gospel. Ah, I get to meet Jesus at his table. No, Jesus, I'm far off. There's no, uh, I will be with you always. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's just like a pithy, th no. <laughs> there's no, pr there's no presence of Christ there. But in conjunction with this, notice again what Dr. Clark points out regarding the marks of the true local church and the ministry of word and sacrament. The recovery of the ancient Christian doctrine and practice of the sacraments was so essential to the Reformation that the Reformed churches in Europe and the British Isles spoke of the right use of the sacraments as marks of the true church. In Article 29 of the Belgic Confession, the French and, and Dutch-speaking churches confessed that there are three marks of a true church, the pure preaching of the gospel, the pure administration of the sacraments, and the use of church discipline. The phrase pure administration of the sacraments was a shorthand way of rejecting both the Anabaptists and Rome. Close quote. Adventism does not meet these marks. They don't have the pure preaching of the gospel because they don't have the gospel. They don't have the pure administration of the sacraments, which requires the pure preaching of the gospel. He mentions the phrase pure administration regarding the sacraments and how it's used to state the rejection of the Anabaptist faulty practices. Again, this is who the SDAs more resemble, the Anabaptists, not Protestants. Now notice what Charles Hodge says in his systematic theology, where he highlights another foundational part of the Reformation. We've got law gospel distinction, the monergism, the ministry of, of word and sacrament, the sacraments being a means of grace, a countless other things so far, but now we're going to move on to another one. Dr. Clark already pointed out earlier that Protestants affirm sola fide and sola gratia, two of the five solas, while now Hodge is going to explain to us the third, which is sola scriptura. The SDA church loves to claim they're in line with this, citing what we saw Ellen White say earlier. Remember what she said. Notice, quote, all Protestants, all Protestants agree in teaching that the word of God as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Infallible. It's not just Bible only. When it says that was in response to two lines of infallible standard. That's the context of the statement of Sola Scriptura. You don't just get to take the phrase and say, well, it just means Bible only. No, it means Bi Bible only what? It's the only infallible rule of faith and practice. He continues, all Protestants agree, one, that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the word of God written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and are therefore infallible and of divine authority in all things pertaining to faith and practice and consequently free from all error that's inerrancy, Adventists, whether of doctrine, fact, or precept. Two, 
They contain all the extant su supernatural revelations of God designed to be a rule of faith and practice to his church. And three, that they are sufficiently perspicuous to be understood by the people in the use of ordinary means and by the aid of the Holy Spirit in all things necessary to faith and practice without the need of an infallible interpreter. Close quote. So get this, folks. This is key. Sola Scriptura is not Bible only. Hodge rightly points out, Sola Scriptura is the belief that Scripture is the only infallible rule of faith and practice, not the only rule outright. <laughs> Protestants affirm the historic Christian creeds, for example, because they're an accurate summation of what Scripture teaches. But the Scriptures are the only infallible rule of faith and practice for the church, over and against Rome's claim of capital T tradition also being another infallible source of authority, which works, ex uh, works itself into papal supremacy and the magisterial authority, sorry, and the magisterial authority being infallible interpreters over the scriptures. Which is why Hodge then adds that Protestants believe in the perspicuity of scripture, that all things needed for faith and practice can be clearly understood from scripture without the need of an infallible interpreter. Not that every single doctrine of scripture is such. But that what's, which is necessary pertaining to salvation and the gospel is plainly clear. There are obviously doctrines that are advanced, complex. You get into minutia and mechanics. But the SDA church does not affirm, affirm that scripture is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Remember how Ellen defined it, which is how the SDA church is, is forced to. The Bible and the Bible only is the rule of faith and practice. Not that it's the only rule that's infallible. That's a major difference. Notice what Dr. Scott Manich says. Quote, Evangelical Christians in North America sometimes misunderstand the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura to mean that the Bible is the Christian's only theological resource that it can and should be denuded of its churchly context, meaning nuda scriptura. Such an understanding is altogether incorrect. So catch that. The belief in Bible only is called nuda scriptura. It is a distinct and separate con concept. It, it detaches scripture from church history entirely, and then it seeks to read it apart from that, which has always been and always will lead to all sorts of ancient heresy being resurrected. But he continues. Calvin believed that Holy Scripture as the only infallible rule of faith and practice should serve as the final authority by which to judge Christian doctrine and practice, but it was not his only resource for theology. Consequently, he regularly consulted and appealed to early Christian documents and church authorities, most notably Augustine, to gain theological insight and clarity on contested doctrinal matters. He recognized the strategic importance of demonstrating the continuity of Protestant teaching with the core convictions of the early church. Thus, his regular refrain, the ancient church is on our side. Close quote. Very clearly, and this is just one of many examples, the Protestant reformers folks were not Bible only like the John Loma Kang and Ellen, John Loma Kangs and Ellen White's and, and, and SDAs want to tell us. They didn't disregard church history and those that came before us and read scripture completely detached from that in a vacuum. I mean, just a casual read of any of the reformers will show that this is, is, is the case. They're constantly citing and pointing to, to others, namely those of the patristic era. Which is why Dr. Manish just point, he points out that Calvin's battle cry was that the ancient church is on the side of the reformers. That's what they argued with Rome in this context. What were those early believers saying and claiming? But neither side was saying what the SDA church is. <laughs> so another important aspect of Sola Scriptura and the evidence that the SDA church does not affirm the actual meaning of the term, inerrancy. Yes, the SDA church rejects inerrancy because of Ellen White. They have to, because they have to have the two on the same platform. But notice, Matthew Barrett. What does he say here regarding sola scriptura and inerrancy? Quote, to get a full picture of sola scriptura, we need to go beyond saying the Bible is merely inspired or God breathed. Inspiration should lead to an understanding that the Bible is perfect and flawless. In other words, 
Inerrancy is the necessary corollary of inspiration. They are two sides of the same coin, and it's impossible to divorce them from one another. Because it's God speaking, that's the key. Because it's God speaking, and he is a God of truth, not error, his word must be true and trustworthy in all it addresses. And because inerrancy is a biblical corollary and consequence of divine inspiration, inseparably connected and intertwined, it is a necessary component of Sola Scriptura. Close quote. We're going to be doing a stream responding to Dr. Judd Lake on this issue in the coming weeks. But Protestants affirm the inerrancy of Scripture. Adventists reject it as a fundamentalist idea, which shows, no, they don't even understand what Sola Scriptura entails. It is not Bible onlyism, Adventists. The SDA Church doesn't affirm that either, by the way. Ellen White and the GC in session are also infallible rules of authority for them. But notice what he says. God is unerring and infallible by nature such that when he reveals something, it's always true, accurate, and perfect. Inerrancy and, and Sola Scriptura are tied ultimately to Scripture being unique by virtue of the source. It's unique. It's the only infallible thing because it's God speaking. That's different and distinct from the church and, and tradition, etc. But the SDA church has to reject this because they have to put Ellen White in the same category as the Bible writers, but then to try to ascribe a, ascribe a lower level of authority to her. As it pertains to interpretation, remember how Hodge rightly pointed out, no infallible interpreters needed. That's the Protestant view. This was in response to the Roman magisterium claiming infallible interpretive authority. So we've looked at this before, but for those who, 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 we did, who didn't see it. June 3rd, 1971, Review and Herald. Notice what it says. Official organ of the SDA church here. Quote, Protestants have always claimed that the Bible is its own interpreter. Perhaps it's better to say the spirit of prophecy, we use the term here as synonymously with the gift of prophecy, or testimony of Jesus is its own interpreter. The Bible is an infallible guide, but it needs to be infallibly interpreted to avoid confusion and division. Ah, so the SDA church claims to have an infallible interpreter of the infallible book, which is found in the writings of Ellen G. White, because she supposedly possessed the spirit of prophecy which is supposedly Jesus speaking through her writings. So they have simply replaced the Roman magisterium and the papacy with the writings of Ellen White. Are you noticing the trend here? So Mr. Lomakang, again, I agree. Protestantism has been hijacked, just not in the way that you're going to put forth. Now let's look at something that correlates to what Burkhoff mentioned regarding the marks of true and valid local church, according to Protestantism. Sorry, I said Burkhoff. I meant Dr. Clark again. Notice what he writes. Quote, We should not simply assume that all these groups that call themselves church are such. As early as 1561, the Dutch Reformed churches recognized this problem with respect to the Anabaptists, whom all the confessing Protestants rejected as part of the Reformation altogether. The church has confessed, for all sects in the world today claim for themselves the name of the church, even though they are not actually churches. This is how we deal today with many of the groups that arose in the 19th century as part of the so-called Second Great Awakening and the other groups. So pause real quick. All of the reformers, regardless of the branch, rejected the radical reformers and their hyper overcorrections. And then notice the quotation. There are a number of sects in the world today that claim the name of the church, even though they are not actually valid local churches. And Dr. Clark's recommendation is that this is how one is to view these sects in our day as well. He utilizes the term sect for a specific reason, which we will highlight momentarily, but he continues. Other groups, such as the Millerites, who gave us the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Christian Scientists, the traditional Seventh-day Adventists, and virtually all of the Pentecostal groups that arose out of the Cane Ridge revivals, 
in the early 19th century and the Topeka and Azusa Street revivals in the early 20th century. In 16th century terms, in the language of the Belgic Confession, these are mostly sects and not churches at all since they lack the marks of the true church, namely the pure preaching of the gospel and the pure administration of the sacraments and the use of church discipline. Close quote. Adventism, folks, is a sect, not a valid Christian church and a part of the universal body. They do not bear the, bear the marks of the true and valid local church. And Clark points out those marks like we looked at earlier. Now, notice what church historian, Philip Schaff, we love Schaff. Notice what he says in his book, The Principles of Protestantism. The SDA church loves to cite Dr. Schaff, like we saw with Doug Batchelor and Mark Finley. Notice what he says regarding sex. Quote, along with the bright aspects just noticed, so he went over some of the highlights of Protestantism. Protestantism also has its revolutions, its rationalisms, its sex, which are all the more dangerous foes. Inasmuch as they all claim to be its most true legitimate offspring. Interesting. The sect system, like rationalism, is a prostitution and caricature of true Protestantism and nothing else. We have shown in the first part of this tract that the Reformation was no arbitrary novelty. But the fruit of all the better tendencies of the Catholic Church itself. That the Reformers aimed at no separation from the reigning church, but that this was wholly the work of the Pope. Had they been permitted to preach the pure word of God with freedom and to administer the sacraments according to Christ's appointment, they would have remained in their original communion. Mr. Loma Kang, they were not just protesting every single thing about the Roman Catholic Church as revolutionaries, which is what you guys try and often point it as, or paint it as. They would have remained exactly where they were. And Schaff is recognizing that while Protestantism has many upsides, there are the downsides of many sects and rationalist movements that have risen up in the name of Protestantism. And like I said, the Roman Catholic Church loves to point to these sects as low-hanging fruit to say, see, look at the fruit of Protestantism. But sects in this context are groups that are offshoots of Protestantism that claim to be legitimately part of the true thing and are not. They are a caricature. And notice, he points out a key aspect that's often lost today. Like I was just saying, the Reformers still considered themselves Catholics. They were not revolutionaries on a mission to start a new church in the 1600s. This is often the narrative foisted onto history regarding the Roman church and SDAs that, who often accept that because it supports their novel 19th century efforts as well. But it's not true. They were booted from the church by the papacy who they viewed to be an unlawful, illegitimate office of the church, according to scripture. Thus, the Pope had no authority to boot them. Calvin even gets into this in his institutes when he talks about their anathematizing, the Roman church's anathematizing of the East. And he says, on what grounds? Because you just, you just deem them to be schismatics? We don't accept that. <laughs> And they, uh, in, in that regard, obviously there's a number of things they're going to disagree with us on, but in that regard, they agreed. But had the reformers simply been able to perform the ministry of word and sacrament, they would have remained in their original communion. So when Mr. Lomakang, or anyone else for that matter, tries postulating that Luther was some sort of revolutionary on a mission to break away from the church and start some new one, they are wrong. This is not at all true. But now notice, what does, he goes on, what does he go on to say? Quote, But in what Orthodox Protestant party of our day is this forbidden? No man is in danger with us of being burned or disposed for preaching the gospel. Both in the Reformed churches and in the Lutheran, thank God, the word may be proclaimed in its purity and both the conversion of souls may go forward without hindrance. In this view, therefore, our position, in contrast to Rome, is wholly different so that modern sectarians have no good reason whatsoever for breaking communion with the church. 
True, there are defects and faults enough in each of these churches, talking about Lutheran and Reformed, but these may and should be reproved within the communion itself, that so if possible, the whole body may be healed. When moreover the Reformers, for conscience sake, and because they would obey God and his word rather than men and their, or, and their ordinances, proceeded to form a communion in their own, nothing could be further from their intention in doing so than to throw open the door for the system of sex. Their object was not to upset the church and break the regular course of its historical life, but only to restore it once more to clear light and sure rule of God's word, not to emancipate the individual to uncontrolled freedom, but to bind him to the definite object authority of God's truth and grace. The definite objective, sorry. Luther exhibited the doctrine of justification as precisely the true ground of Christian union and fought with all the strength of his gigantic spirit against the fanatical and factitious tendencies of his time. Close quote. Does this at all sound like Adventism? Their entire mission is about shaking up the church universal and calling everyone to come out of it and join them. Schaff points out that sectarian groups have no basis whatsoever for breaking communion with the church and trying to point to the Reformation to support such is not only erroneous, but ahistorical. That isn't what the reformers were doing, and they weren't opening the door for others to just up and do the same. At least that wasn't their intention. The Protestant reformers' object was not to upset and disturb the church universal and bring about total theological anarchy opening the door for any sort of sect or group to then latch onto them to try and validate themselves. But he then tacks on sola fide, the Protestant teaching regarding justification as a hallmark of true Christian union. Adventism is a sect, folks. It is not Protestant. And when they claim such, they are either ill-informed on what that actually means, or they're being dishonest with the facts. Now, I know that was quite a bit of information. And we're very shortly in, but it matters. Being Protestant is not simply protesting the Roman Catholic Church. The protestation was rooted in beliefs, specific beliefs. So to recap, notice the hallmarks. Some of these I talked about, others I didn't, but they're still true nonetheless. Protestants are monergists, not synergists. Doesn't matter if it was the German Reformation, Swiss, English, Italian, French. The SDA Church is on the Roman Catholic side of the Reformation on this issue. Protestants affirm the five solas, which again, those mean specific things. You, you don't just get to take the phrases like the SDA Church does and just insert whatever you want into the, the phrase. Like with sola fide, they'll vehemently assert, we believe in sola scriptura, sola fide. But as you see, they then redefine what that means and just use the slogan to try and appear like they do when they don't believe what it actually means because they've denuded the phrase from history. Protestants believe the law gospel distinction. The SDA church 100% is not in line with this. Again, universal across the entirety of the Reformation. Another area they are on the Roman side. Protestants affirm the visible invisible church distinction. The SDA church is in line with the Anabaptists and the radical reformers on this issue with regards to that distinction. But furthermore, they're in their own category because they think they're the remnant. Protestants affirm the ministry of word and sacrament. The SDA church is not at all in line with Protestants on this. Protestants affirm church discipline. You could maybe give them a point on this. It's more like excommunication or disfellowshipping. Protestants affirm infant baptism. Again, they are in line with the Anabaptists on this, not Protestants. Protestants are creedal. Apostles, Nicene, Athanasian Creed. The SDA Church rejects the creeds and affirms their no creed but the Bible, which Adventists, that's a creed in and of itself. Everyone has a creed. But not just that, their, their 28 fundamental beliefs are also a creed. Protestants believe in a finished atonement. They're like Rome, Adventism is. And even claim the same things they'll, they'll, sometimes to, that, that Rome will to justify the mass. 
when SDA scholars say stuff like, we believe in a completed incomplete atonement, this is really no different than what Rome claims the mass is in regards to the, the it's not a re-sacrificing of Christ. It's a representation of Christ, but it's propitiatory, right? <laughs> well, the work that Jesus is doing in heaven in the investigative judgment is supposedly propitiatory. I could spend all night on this too, but the point is, no, Adventists, you don't have a finished atonement. You have a long drawn out propitiatory work, just like Rome has, and that work isn't finished yet. This is not at all compatible, isn't compatible with Protestantism. Cessationism. No modern prophets. Didn't touch on this one, but the Protestant reformers were cessationist. They did not affirm modern prophets, let, a one, let alone one like Ellen White, who supposedly serves as an infallible interpreter from God of the scriptures, which is the roadmap, they'll say, or the, the map in the storm of whatever. No, completely contra Protestant belief. And then another one, the Lord's Day is the first day. Yes, universal. No Protestants were Judaizers. Never have been. None of them affirmed the seventh day Sabbath. This is one of those Anabaptist areas where they'll, they'll claim, yeah, because you didn't reform far enough. <laughs> Even though they very much rightly understood why the church universally meets on the first day and it was because of the new creation. <laughs> Notice nothing about eschatology. Adventists love appealing to the reformers to try and claim they align with them in eschatology, so therefore they're heirs to them. No, you're not. Just because the SDA church claims to be historicists regarding prophetic interpretation does not make you a part of Protestant lineage. Not all Protestant were, Protestants were historicists for, the star, for starters, which automatically eliminates you guys because unlike Adventism, the reformers didn't anathematize people who had different views on eschatology. You can't even be a Seventh-day Adventist without being a premillennial historicist because eschatology is the foundation for their movement. Yet it isn't for Protestants or any branch of the Christian church for that matter, because Protestants aren't the only Christians. But on top of all of that, yes, there's more. Adventists have their own novel gospel message that no one before them had supposedly. We have looked at this before. But again, for those who have not seen it, this is the May 5th, 1932 Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, official organ of the SDA church. Quote, in harmony with this idea that this message is limited to the period between 1844 and the end, talking about their everlasting gospel, we find that no one prior to 1844 had ever claimed to have given this threefold message, neither Luther nor Calvin nor Knox, Wesley, Alexander Campbell, or any of the other great lights of those times set up the claim that they were doing this predicted work of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. If this work had been done by any of them, they would surely have known it. Yeah, faulty assumption. They didn't believe that they were doing. They didn't believe what you do about this passage. That's why none of them believe that. This prophecy of Revelation 14, 6 through 14 does not and cannot refer to any proclamation of the gospel in the days of the apostles, excuse me, the early church fathers, or the reformers of the 16th, 17th, or 18th centuries. It is strictly a last day message applicable to those who live just before the return of Christ. Close quote. So what the SDA church calls the gospel was not preached before them because they think the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14 has to do with a special end times message for a specific group of people who God would raise up to take to the rest of the world. It wasn't preached by the apostles, the church fathers, the reformers, etc. Only them. That is not at all a Protestant belief, as Protestants never have claimed the gospel fell away and needed restored, or that there's some special present truth end times, or that people before the, the reformers didn't actually have and understand the gospel. This is in part why the SDA church doesn't meet the true marks of the ministry of word and sacrament. Because the word part of that equation has to include the true gospel. Again, not a novel, end times, special truth, present truth gospel that only a select people have who got it from God through the means of a 19th century woman in Northeast America. Notice what Herbert Douglas says regarding this in his paper, What is the Everlasting Gospel? Probably the foremost SDA theologian to date. 
Quote, the purpose of the gospel is to make plain why Jesus came and why he died. The everlasting gospel, so we get a contrast here, in the end times restores the New Testament gospel in its wholeness, in its integrity. It explains God's plan to save men and women in such a way that their presence in the new earth would not jeopardize again the well-being and security of the universe. That's why I said earlier, you have to demonstrate that you're safe to save. It vindicates God's character, but it also demonstrates that you can be trusted to not let sin enter again. He continues, Thus the gospel is not limited to the good news of his pardon and forgiveness. It presents the ellipse of truth that reveals the integrity of God's grace as including his forgiveness and his power to transform. Close quote. So the everlasting gospel is contrasted with just the gospel. Two different things. And the everlasting gospel for SDAs is supposedly the fullness of the plain old gospel that was revealed in the end times to the SDA church through the great controversy theme and Ellen White. He continues, The gospel ellipse is revealed beautifully in the book of Hebrews as mercy and grace to help. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help uh, to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 John expresses the same good news as forgiveness and cleansing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 Paul saying, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes has faith. Romans 1.16, the irony. In light of what we just read from J.L. Schuler and the everlasting gospel being a special end times message that only SDAs have, Herb cites Romans 1.16. <laughs> Yet the apostles weren't preaching the everlasting gospel. So Paul apparently had a limited gospel in view in Romans 1. <laughs> what a mess. He continues, The everlasting gospel adds much more to limited gospels that focus only on one half of the gospel ellipse. The religion of Christ, now he cites from Christ Object Lessons, the religion of Christ means more than the forgiveness of sins. It means taking away our sins and filling the vacuum with the graces of the Holy Spirit. It means a heart emptied to, of self, the glory, the fullness, the completeness of the gospel plan is fulfilled in the life. So listening again to Revelation 14, the everlasting gospel will get a fair and full hearing in the end times. Limited gospels that ridicule adherence to God's expressed will, aka the Ten Commandments, as being outside of the gospel, a law gospel distinction, will appear inadequate beside the clear proclamation of the everlasting gospel. Limited gospels that cry legalism. Ah, you're mixing law and gospel. That's legalism. Oh, this is what he's responding to. Limited gospels that cry legalism at any attempt to embrace faithful obedience will be seen as contrary to the message of the New Testament grace. Close quote. You guys aren't Protestant. It's just a bunch of buzzwords to say we reject the law gospel distinction and we think that obedience and faith makes a person right with God. And if you disagree, this is why SDAs will then say, oh, so you, you just are advocating for lawlessness. False dilemma fallacy. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is you're hitching up just like, again, back to the whole core issue of law gospel distinction. Sola fide, recognizing the distinction between justification, sanctification, justification being a one-time act not a drawn-out thing over time, enjoined with sanctification, like Rome says, which again, the SDA church is on that side of the Reformation. But we got the erroneous claim that they make that they're the only ones teaching obedience to God. And it's these limited gospels that cry legalism when they hear and see the SDA church's unlawful use of the law and claim that obedience maintains a person's justification before God, which Ellen White very plainly states when she says, quote, when God, or while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Close quote. 
completely flies in the face of monergism and sola fide, two things that are central to Protestantism. We aren't rejecting obedience to God and living a holy life by virtue of rejecting the SDA church's inability to distinguish between the law and the gospel. We aren't disparaging obedience by recognizing that the SDA church doesn't properly recognize that justification is a single act done by God, which then leads to a changed life, but that changed life and behavior isn't what maintains one's righteous standing before God. This is all a caricature from the SDA church and their scholars to make it seem like they just believe People should be obedient to God, and everyone else is an antinomian theological anarchist. The Bible does not talk about the everlasting gospel being a different, more full gospel than just the gospel. (laughs) This is, again, the SDA church inserting an unfounded distinction where Scripture does not make one. There's not a bunch of limited gospels and then a more full one. Paul is clear in Galatians 1. You either have the gospel or you don't, period. And the SDA church has a false one. It's not what the apostles who received the gospel from Jesus himself were preaching. Herb Douglas' statement puts what the, apostles were, what the apostles were preaching in a limited gospel category. Because they weren't preaching what the SDA church calls the everlasting gospel. <laughs> but all of that to say, Mr. Lomakang, you are absolutely correct. Protestantism has been hijacked. Hijacked by sex, like Adventism, who try and ride the coattails of the Reformation having no clue what they're even trying to hitch themselves to, to add legitimacy to their movement when, in reality, you're your own thing that sprang up in the 19th century with no actual connection to the church in history. You guys have confused people, and and you give talks like this that only further confuse people. The Protestant Reformation centered around soteriology, the doctrines around salvation, Hence why Luther said that monergism and synergism were the hinge and why justification was such a hotly contested subject. You guys are on the Roman side of the Reformation on this subject, not the Reformers. You guys are synergists on steroids. You affirm hyper-free willism. And you guys don't affirm a law gospel distinction. So if you're going to make the charge that Protestantism is apostate, that would mean that at one time it was legitimate. Well, those hallmarks are all classical Protestantism, not modern-day evangelicalism, classical Protestantism. So I guess they didn't even meet the standard of Protestantism according to this movement. The actual first-generation reformers. (laughs) But I know that was a lot. That's the foundation. That's what it means to be Protestant. Keep these things in mind through his talk here. Because as we're going to see, his postulating of what Protestantism was and is is totally off base and incorrect, showcasing that the foundation for their whole idea of apostate Protestantism is based on a caricature and revising of history. 